Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk About Sex. Um, I should warn you, we're going to be talking about sex. So if you are <laughs> of a slightly faint-hearted or don't like to hear rude words, I apologise if we offend you. But we'd like to talk as candidly as possible today. So I hope that's all right with everybody. Um, I'd love to introduce the, pa uh, the panel here. Um, Rowan Pelling is the saucy journalist who, after leaving Oxford with a degree in English literature, has had a prolific career writing for a wide range of publications, from Private Eye and GQ to The Independent and The Daily Telegraph. In 1997, she took over as editor of the Erotic Review, the newsletter taking a literary approach to sexuality, turning it into one of the country's most loved magazines. In 2017, she launched The Amorist, an anthology of erotica, news and fiction. But most recently, she has turned her hand to setting up Perspective, a new current affairs magazine. Welcome. Aside from writing for every major newspaper and magazine in the UK, from The Guardian to Grazia, Daisy Buchanan is the author of several non-fiction books, including How to Be a Grown-Up, and most recently, her Times best-selling novel, Insatiable, a love story, <laughs> yeah, a love story for greedy girls. An avid reader, Daisy loves books about sisterhood, self-help, and sex. She is also a host of a top-ranked podcast, You're Booked, in which she takes an investigative role and noses around her favourite author's bookshelves. She is launching a new podcast, Daisy is Insatiable, created to accompany her book. Welcome, Daisy, as well. I should probably also say my name is Louise Agron. Um, I'm an advisor to the festival. I have literally no qualification to be here. <laughs> Other than I've done quite a lot of internet dating, so, <laughs> <laughs> so and that's, that's it really. So, okay, um, I think maybe it'd be interesting for us all to know how you both got into writing and editing about sex. I love reading about sex. I am a huge fan of uh, Jilly Cooper and Jackie Collins and my formative reading is finding those Dilly Cooper books when I knew that I shouldn't get to them. And I often thought that, you know, sex is everywhere. I still remember reading Emma, and there's a part where I believe, I might be getting the names wrong, but um, possibly Frank Churchill is accused of trying to make love to her in a carriage. And I thought, oh, how daring, I knew they were having it off in those days. And then someone explained <laughs> that linguistically making love was a different sort of proposition in the 18th century. But I was so... I, mean, I loved that, this idea of fantasy and desire, and I'm 36, I had the internet, but it was dial-up, it made the noise, there was one computer in the house, you know, you went to the study and everyone could see you, so there was no porn for me. So when I wanted gratification and ideas, I turned to books, which are much easier to sort of to pass around and get my hands on. And so this was, I suppose, the result of starting out as... A, fantasy and really wanting to write the sort of book that I wanted to read and feeling that we're perhaps at a time when pleasure and female pleasure isn't on the agenda. Sex is everywhere, but it's quite negative and scary. And understandably, there's lots that we should be very upset about and be complaining about and changing. But I wanted to write something that was giddy and fun and joyous and also to have a heroine who's madly horny, but not necessarily confident, which is often how I feel. And I do love... Jackie Collins, but there's lots of light. And she went into the boardroom in her power suit and she knew that every man in there wanted her. Like, no, can't relate, never felt that. <laughs> I, I think um, very similarly, it's probably true for lots of you that um, I first found sex through books. And I think I was quite young. I think I was 11 when I went through my parents' bookshelves suddenly thinking, oh, my God, look at this. This is really dirty, all these dusty penguin covers. But, the, you know, there was a copy of Lady Chatterley's Lover and it did fall open on incriminating <laughs> pages. Um, the forget-me-nuts. <laughs> yeah. The, the Godfather, too, page 17 of the paperback, I seem to remember, where there was, um, yeah, a sort of vivid sex scene between the Godfather's son, Sonny, and a bridesmaid at the wedding, and the, all these things. I didn't really get it, but um, it definitely made me, as they say, say feel funny down there. Um, <laughs> and then at school, I remember we were, you know, in boring lessons, we were writing filthy stories, passing a book under the desk, and I was just really good at it. <laughs> I was, you know, probably because I'd read all this filth on my parents' uh, bookshelves. So um, I, see, I seem to remember I was voted 
And this was a school for daughters of missionaries in seven years. Um, I was voted girl most likely to run a brothel by my <laughs> peers. That's the category. Yeah. It, was a, yeah, it wasn't a formal one. Um, and then, yeah, I did English literature and I thought everything was going to go down a sort of more normal route. But I uh, got a terrible degree, various things went wrong. And there was a point where just no one would employ me. Um, and I met a man at a wedding and he offered me a very nice job in his um, market research company and it would be doing qualitative market research and you'd be talking to people about the preferences. At the same time, someone else I'd met was running something called the Erotic Prince Society and he said, oh, we're just having a Christmas rush, we're desperate for someone to help out, you know, you just have to answer the phone and go how many books of bottoms would you like? Or, <laughs> you know, do you want the images of spanking? And these two jobs were in my head, you know, the better paid market research <laughs> and the one where you'd talk about spanking down the phone uh, to majors from Tunbridge Wells. <laughs> and, uh, I, weirdly, I went with that one. That seemed like a better story. And it has been a good story that's now lasted about 27 years. So... Oh, it's been, uh, what, are, what are people's reaction to you when you tell them, you know, when you tell them what you do or they know you? I mean, how, how do people tell, tell you all of their problems? Yeah. Or... Yes, I bet they do to Daisy too. I mean, I, I, MPs, I'm carrying around quite a few <laughs> MPs, sordid secrets that have not yet made the headlines. <laughs> it's been really thrilling and strange. Um, I live in Margate and I met someone at a... Um, a bar there recently who'd read the book and sort of rushed over and said thank you for turning me on I'm like, you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose that's you know, I'm thinking that this is it's not a chronicle and it's it's not journalism and it's not something that's drawn from my experience but I'm really hoping that it's a you know to, I, I fantasize and I hope you do too and it's, you know, it's safe and it's fun. And my goodness, the year we've all just had, we've all mm. been spending lots of time by ourselves. I can't think of a better thing to do with that time. Absolutely. I also, Absolutely. I also think that we talk about imagination. You know, so if, if someone's building a new housing development, we always talk about how much imagination, you know, it should be so creative, it should be green space, we should think about the environment, wonderful architecture. And we do this all around. And yet somehow, if you say we should be really imaginative, when we're thinking about eroticism and sex and we should really bring our mind to it and it's fine to go to quite sort of to break the boundaries. Mm. Everyone gets very nervous. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I'd like to talk about the nature of desire and what is it and how it's expressed and particularly how it sits in the context of sort of instant sexual gratification that we seem to be seeing quite a lot of. I do think... and. One of the reasons I wanted to write this book was I, I felt like desire was missing, that sex was everywhere, but it was all just quite explicit and immediate and there was no yearning and no wondering. Mm. And desire is so nebulous, isn't it? How do we express it? And it's so different for every single one of us. And I think we're told what to desire. And also we're all being manipulated in increasingly mm. sophisticated ways, not just, well, hopefully not at all in terms of sexual desire, but, you know, sex sells, maybe slightly. But every advert we see, and also adverts are creeping into every space, is about trying to tell us what we want when we didn't really want it. And again, I think mm. that's something where we're happy to talk about that in terms of, you know, a shower gel, but to talk about that, what it means to sex and who we are sexually, it's really difficult. I think now as well we're so... We're quite puritanical, we're quite judgmental. It, it feels like that's hard than ever. And on the one hand, people are saying, I oh, know we're wilder, we're more outrageous, anything goes. But also, everything seems quite public and quite polarised. And I think it's just about creating a space for exploration and conversation. You don't have to do any of the things you dream about and any of the things that you wonder about, but just thinking about them can be fun. And thinking about them... I find free something in me that I'm very, very anxious. And actually it's fantasizing that is my, you know, only really effective cure for anxiety. You know, if I wake up at four o'clock in the morning and I can't go back to sleep, I know that, you know, actually I still have lots of Jilly Cooper books on my phone <laughs> and there are <laughs> certain passages of rivals that really help. <laughs> I think it's also, you know, I'm 53 and one of the things each decade goes by, I think, how interesting, I'm a completely different human being now than I was 10 years ago. And 
And my desires are normally different. And I think it takes all of us actually a lifetime to understand our own desire and, and to admit to it because desire and appetite is scary and very often for women quite scary because you know, I've just joked about going to a school for daughters of missionaries, but it, it was... No, it was like going to a, to a convent or something. There were, there were actual missionaries teaching us who told us sex was bad. And, you know, we had um, a thing about if you met a boy, you were supposed to go something like, um, halt, young man, and go no further. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that happens in my lifetime. I was told to say Unbelievable. that. Unbelievable. So, yeah. I, you know, you, one minute... <laughs> I was so terrified. You know, my mum was lovely and she, on one level she was quite open about sex, told us the facts of life when we were still at primary school. But on another, there was a real thing about, you know, you mustn't have sex before marriage. You know, I did grow up with that. And just lots of baffling things that you then have to unravel. And I just think about, you know, the people who've talked to me um, about things that have happened to them, you know, often so difficult and so dark and they're so glad um, that someone will listen without judgment and go... That's fine, you know, it's almost like being absolved. And I think that's really hard for people because to admit what you want, if you think someone else is going to go, that's bad or peculiar. Or even, we were talking about this, when you're young, you know how you can only fancy people that your friends tell you are okay? If you go, well, actually, I think, you know, he's nice, and they go, ugh, mm -hmm. you know, no way. You suddenly deny it. We, we, we're all quite good at denying what we want. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, I think we, we, we do that all the time. I think this sort of fear of judgment mm. isn't there. And I just wondered whether that's something that has changed, you know, is, is that any better now, I suppose? I'm, I'm sort of asking you, Daisy, but, you know. I mean, I think we only judge people because we're frightened of what we see in ourselves. And, you know, well, I remember it so vividly at school as well, secretly agreeing with someone maybe about, you know, who's fanciable and what. Mm. I still remember um, a conversation I had with a school friend about masturbating and you know if that sort of swear you will never tell anyone you know but <laughs> I do that and there was no sort of sense of like I do this and I enjoy it or I choose to do it or like just you know it's so I, I think she said I only ever do it over my knickers or something and then she mentioned another girl and she, you know she does it properly like she actually touches her own body how disgusting how revolting mm -hmm. the horror and I, I think that's it that wanting to believe that we're getting increasingly better at you know being open-minded and seeing each other and understanding each other but i think that if we judge it's because we're still so frightened about what we have and that's because we've all got parents and teachers and mm. you know vicars who loom large i think it's really difficult to kind of <laughs> <laughs> pardon Sorry. the pun yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We could go into carry well, on territory quite revealing here. there. But, um, <laughs> but, I, I, but you know, everything we inherit and all of that judgment, and we, can, we want to think of ourselves as very sane, reasonable, liberal adults mm. who are down with it all. But we are still, I think, you know, it's very hard to kind of get the, the curious, frightened 10-year-old mm. who's asking questions but scared to ask, ask any questions. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I think... Um, I, I, I suppose if you were an, an observer looking at the world now, you might think, gosh, hasn't it changed so much? Aren't people more liberal, more expressive about their sexuality, more fluid? You know, yeah. and actually, um, it's not necessarily the case, yeah. is it? Yeah, I think it's still very judgy. I mean, like, children who are 17 and 13, and you, you hear them say quite judgmental things about friends, and there's a, there's a big sort of vocabulary of sort of wrong or you know that's in some way you know they they just they, they you know the, the, they already have inbuilt from television lots of um pejorative terms for things that they think are no good which is just it's just a palette of choices mm. to me sexual taste mm. you know apart from the stuff that we all agree as a society is you know frankly not a good idea or morally really really terrible other than that you, you know i know I've talked to people who get off on wearing, you know, they're called furries. They wear furry sort of costumes, and that's part of their erotic ensemble, be dressing up as a sort of bear and a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to know now, and don't worry, I won't ask you. I swear there's someone in this room that's like, a bear, you say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not into that. <laughs> bet there are, bet there are. 
Um, I wanted to sort of talk about um, marriage and marital sex, talking about whether things have changed. And um, I was going to pose the question, is, is marital sex fit for purpose? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm that sort of curious mix of things that I, I am both a sort of total romantic who, on one level, absolutely, you know, understands the urge to go, you know, I'm committing to you for all time till the end of, you know, the planet burns and, you know, we'll still our souls entwined, we'll go on forever. And then the certain knowledge that a lot of us fail that. <laughs> um, and, you know, indeed, I have, I have failed that high standard. And, and those two things, I think, for pretty much all of us, whatever our sexuality, you know, and I, I'm totally in awe and envious of people who have never failed that standard and said that and, you know, just continued to be mutually happy and mutually desiring each other. You know, we do have a problem. We all live a long time now. <laughs> We do, and, um, and it's really hard to feel erotically drawn to someone in that way and desire them, you know, for a long lifetime. And then there's, of course, the conundrum. So I often talk to people, women, very often, who say they're not, you know, they don't, they don't want sex anymore, they're not, they don't feel desire. And then you go, but if you were alone on a desert island and you could, without anyone knowing, you could have the sort of partner of your choice there just for a secret week, Almost everyone will go, oh, yeah, Brad Pitt or, you know, whoever it is, you know, Scarlett Johansson, doesn't matter, but they will have someone in their head. So it's not really about lacking desire. It's, it's how we deal with them. And I do think that just being alive and being a person in the world is not always conducive to being horny. And, also, <laughs> and seeing yourself in a sexy way, because I think that all most of us ever really ultimately want us to feel desired and desirable. And I think that's so hard in a, in a marriage. I've been married for just over five years. Um, I, I really enjoyed in Kat Moran's last book, she introduced the concept of the maintenance shag, which I think when I was in my 20s, I would be horrified and disappointed by. But I do think... Um, and I wrote something... Gosh, where did I write it for? I can't remember. That's dreadful, isn't it? But about the sort of... Um, this is not something that Stalin actually said, but is often falsely attributed to him. <laughs> to him. Where am I going with this? Um, <laughs> quantity has a quality all of its own. And I think that we do... There's so... Um, what life is like as well now is like we think... If we can buy our way out of um, boredom and panic, and that applies sexually as well. And sometimes... You know, I th and it's not how everyone feels, and it's entirely personal. But all I can say is, I think, and I'm also I'm really aware that I've not been married for you know <laughs> long. And if you have you back next year, I might be. And I might all have gone tits up. But you know, I think you just have to shag your way through it. <laughs> okay. So that's one. That's, that's a. But what about what about if one of you doesn't want to shag? Um, yeah. and, and how do you, how can you enforce that? Mm. <laughs> or, 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 you know, yeah. are there other, other solutions? And what would you know, what's your, what's your, for both of you, you know, well, your I, advice and, and, and if that's happening to somebody? Well, that must be devastating, you know, to be rejected by, by your person and sort of to understand that to a point there are all kinds of reasons why it's not going to happen. It's really difficult, because I know lots of, you know, magazines and advice articles say, you know, if you've got sexual problems, you go to a neutral, non-sexy place and you talk them through. I'm mm. like, but would that be the end of, end of everything? I think I it's really know. hard, because I think it's the most common reason for sex lives ending is one person, for whatever reason. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's just because they don't want to. Sometimes, but more often, you know, there's psychological issues, sex become daunting or... You know, there's, there's literal physical changes or, you know, something that's happened to you in the past. A lot of past sexual trauma. I mean, I think far more people have, ha have suffered some form of childhood sex trauma than we as a society admit to. And again, that's just because people tell me things. So now I have a far higher proportion of people I know who have been traumatised and therefore you retreat from sex. But I think if there's two people and they've been married and one person doesn't want to, you, I feel like you have to be able to to form a negotiation if one person really doesn't want to. It seems to be the fairest thing. Mm. As, there's a, actually a sex advisor called Dan Savage in uh, Seattle. Oh, he's brilliant. Yeah, he's br brilliant. Um, and he always says you should be good giving and game. So part of that, if you cannot be giving, your good and game 
is to say to your other half, OK, well, if you, if you seek that, you know, that's important to you. If you do that elsewhere, you can negotiate that. I, I, I know we find this really hard as a society, but it seems better to me than all the misery of, you know, cheating, lying, mm. children. You know, those vibes always go through a, a house. And in some ways, I'm very old-fashioned because, you know, you do see a lot of damage where there have been lies. Mm. Yeah. So what about this the whole notion of marriage, actually? And, I, you know, I, it's sort of something that I think about a lot when I'm looking at Bride magazine. I'm not looking at Bride magazine, but when I see Bride magazine, <laughs> uh, heaven for fen. <laughs> um, and I see, and I think there is, a, you know, there is a real obsession with getting married. There's a yeah. real obsession with weddings, and obviously, notwithstanding, this is a fantastic place to get married. <laughs> uh, go to Heddingham Castle and get married. Um, but, uh, but I mean, but why are we so, why are we still... So obsessed when it's not necessary. It's not you know we're not living in a time when it's necessary. So why are people so keen on it? I think that my generation ish. I thought, oh my god, we're so so anxious. And this is quite a narrow field of experience. We all graduated into the middle of a recession. We all had to intern forever and ever and ever. And if we wanted to do something exciting or interesting, we had to have people who could sort of you know parents who could afford to support us while we did that or you know cobble together other things and this might be a total lie but my understanding is that um gen x there's more of a oh no well i just thought i went traveling for 10 years and i had a lovely time and then i came back when i was 30 and you know someone gave me a nice fun job and then i just i bought a house and it was all okay really and houses didn't cost a million pounds but i think whatever our circumstances are I was sort of told everything is terrifying, everything is difficult, everything is unknowable, all you have is debt and panic, lock something down, it's better to be safe than to be happy. Being happy is taking a massive risk. Um, and I think perhaps especially for women, but definitely for men too, it's really, really easy to be, everyone approves of you if you're very self-sacrificing. You're like, oh, people will accuse me of being selfish if I even stop to think about what I want and that's the worst thing mm. I can possibly be and that applies to sex and it applies to everything else and so the idea of marriage you know it's it's safety and I think the world feels so scary that we crave that safety mm. but mm. then I do wonder whether I'm delighted so so glad and relieved that I <laughs> married my husband having been in lots of truly dreadful relationships where maybe 10, even 10, 20, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, we probably would have got married and it would be, be utterly yeah. awful. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. OK, well, I'd like to also... I'd like to come back to this point about sex in the different generations, the potentially different generations around this, around this panel. Um, I wonder what you think each other are up to. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rowan, what do you think Daisy and her generation are up to? <laughs> well, I definitely... I always take a good long look at um, NATSAL, which is the uh, National Survey of Sexual Lifestyles and Attitudes, because it's the only vaguely reliable sex survey out there. So whenever you see a sex survey, pretty much anywhere, it's honestly totally unreliable. I mean, just, just there are so many bad sex stats out there, like men think about sex every seven seconds. It's, it's all nonsense. <laughs> But NatSal, they, they've put lots of protocols in, so it's, it's pretty, as, pretty much as good as, as it gets. And it says, really authoritatively, that I'm not sure about um, generation... Um, which one are you? You're millennial. Millennial. Uh, so, but one. yeah, Generation Z. <laughs> so Z are slightly younger. Apparently they're having, statistically, they definitely are having less sexual... So fewer, I'm getting confused with my less and fewer now. I should know I'm an editor. Um, se sexual episodes. And so, so this idea we have that the young are always they're having an unbridled, passionate thing, I think there might be more anxiety because there's more performance mm. out there on the internet. And that actually, if you're at all nervous about... Well, it's always nerve-wracking. The first time you have sex, it's bloody terrifying as well as exhilarating. And they've got another layer of terror because they've... They've seen sort of perfect bodies at it. I do think as well, but I wish I had the, the stats to back this up. My understanding is um, younger people are drinking a lot less. Yeah. Not me, I'm keeping my end up there. <laughs> but um, I remember when I was a teenager and, you know, thinking about sort of sex and being in my 20s and dating, I think, how, how on earth do people have sex unless they're 
hammered. Um, I remember a joke about a woman having to talk to her daughter who'd been watching a lot of Dynasty and saying, you know, oh, darling, you know, in real life, people don't just jump into bed with each other. And she said, no, mummy, they normally have a drink first. <laughs> but that needing to be numb and needing to be uninhibited and... I think it's interesting that we've fallen back on that for so long. And I think, I wonder if the younger generation is sort of more anxious, but more, more present. And I think as well that we do tend to focus on the very giddy, exciting sort of, you know, headline mm. banner of, you know, oh, there's sort of the sexual fluidity and there's all of this stuff going on. But then there are lots of young people who sort of forgotten about and unspoken for and you know, don't have the space to express themselves. Like it's, I th Instagram especially, I think it's, mm. it gives and it takes away. And depending on where you go and who you follow, you can see people of all bodies, of every way you can express your being, sort of set people celebrating who they are, and that's a wonderful thing, but it's also so hard to get past that very mm. specific sort of contoured Kardashian aesthetic. Mm. And I think as well that what is sexy now I never see people sort of like letting go and enjoying it. As you say, it does feel very performed mm. and that it's something, something to be good at and not something to be enjoyed. And that breaks my heart. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think some people might be a little surprised about that here. I mean, that, you know, I sort of, my impression is that young people are just going around having, you know, this, sort of, this fluidity, the same sex, poly polyamory, lo lots of stuff going on. But actually, you're, you know, I'm sure you're right. There is a, there is a, there is a it's, be, it's quite polarised. And what do you think that uh, our generation are up to? Oh, I hope you're all just going for like eight hour lunches and <laughs> God, I wish. <laughs> That's what I'd be doing. Um, but I do, I'm interested in, I suppose, when I was much younger, the idea of, you know, say my grandparents having sex, but no, that, that's impossible. That would never happen. Just no. And now, increasingly, I'm thinking, well, sure, there's no, there's no cutoff point. And perhaps you, Gen X or but Gen X yeah. a sort of but I had to intern too <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking actually I mean certainly what I've noticed amongst our age group um, and I suppose I'm particularly tuned into the women here but that we're approaching menopause in a different way it's much more open much more discussed and obviously we've got you know Davina McCall's recent documentary that you know got a lot of um, and, and Kate Muir's written yeah. a book, one, one of the Sunday Times uh, journalists. It's coming out in the autumn and sounds really, really good. But th there's more acknowledgement now that actually, rather than just sh shutting up shop, mm. women might, not just for their bones and all the various benefits that are definite now from the new forms of HRT, but you might want to keep going and you're going to be more in the game. You're going to, yeah, just your juices are going to be flowing better. Everything's going to be working better if you have good HRT. And so my friends tell me, um, well, actually, I, just, I was saying to Daisy, someone, someone gave me some, some of her testosterone gel. And she said, <laughs> she said, this will make you feel, you know, kind of sexy, but also that people... Um, Apparently, women take it before board meetings and things because yeah. it just gets back them. to the dynasty moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and she gave it, so I've I've just like I don't know, but I just rub that on my thigh and see whether I feel, you know, just a little bit more. Yeah, are <laughs> oh, you feeling friskier? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like I feel a bit naughty, like I've taken illegal drugs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> which which they are actually because they um, women it's hard for women to be prescribed yeah. testosterone, even though the best HRT doctors recommend it. Yeah. And I think that's something huge we're only just beginning to talk about. The number of the absolute lack of sort of research for women especially and what's, you know, where our bodies are and what's happening. And yet that sort of expectation that, you know, once you're sort of past 45, it's like, no, just you sit down and be quiet now. You had mm. a good run. And that, you know, I know it's not far away from me and that fills me with horror and I don't want that. And I'm really excited and, you know, filled with gratitude about and inspired by... You know, I think, you know, women in their, you know, 40s and 50s and 60s are beyond, are um, glamorous and sexy. Um, we're talking about, um, this is just sort of gossip now, but um, uh, Deborah um, oh, Mogak, uh, Mogak, I can never say her name properly. I, Mogak. <laughs> I interviewed her a couple of years ago about books. But I was really struck by her sexiness and her yeah. presence. Like, you're one of the sexiest people I've ever met in my life. And that made Who me Deborah? feel... Who's Deborah? Oh, she's Morgan. a novelist. She's a novelist. She, she wrote um, the 
I think it's called, it's the best exotic marigold hotel okay. and tulip Great, just for those. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, I'm actually going to. Uh, you can see this an all female panel here, and I'm actually I think we need to have a bit more perspective on this sort of issue. And I've asked Harry if he wouldn't mind um, giving his view. So I wanted to know whether you whether you agree with what was being discussed here. Particularly, obviously, you're a young person, and you, your your experience of, of sex as a as a as a male generation millennial. This is so. on. Yeah, it's on. It's on. <laughs> you know, you wake up some mornings and you think, how am I going to make this day special? Well, I agree today to be the male perspective on a sex panel. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we got talking last night about this, and it's something I'm really interested in. And I think um, it's so important. Uh, we were discussing yeah, uh, last night that sex is a re really a thing of trust. And um, I, think, I think especially my generation and... Lower, lower than the, than me. We forget sometimes that to have that com like complete connection with someone and to feel like you're you're kind of one person is really, I think, what we we all are searching for in some way. And I think there's definitely the like you say the maintenance shag, <laughs> like, <laughs> which is kind of keeping things going for everyone. But um, I think. Yeah, the the sense of kind of uh, being connected to someone yeah. is is something where you kind of go, oh, that's that's actually what we're all looking for, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I think I think a, a lot of the time, in my observation as well, is that people aren't necessarily looking for the act of sex. Sometimes mm. they are, but so, a lot often they're looking for intimacy, connection with another person, that warmth, that closeness. And I think, particularly after the year we've had, that is something that a lot of people want to want to experience. It's just, I suppose it's just it's just just finding that really. Um, I I wanted actually to, so thank you for that. But You're conversely, welcome. I wanted to talk about the orgasm gap because there are. Uh, actually completely the opposite of what I've just said, but there are reports that women are still not being satisfied or don't feel satisfied. And I wondered what your, what your view on that was, both I, of your I views. Think, I think it's about... I think women report about 60% of the time that they might... It might be even lower than that, that they kind of have some recognisable form of <laughs> sexual satisfaction that sort of equates to an orgasm and as much discussed orgasms it's quite hard to totally define whether one person's orgasm is the same as another for women I think mm. but yeah men it's pretty near 100 <laughs> percent so Jess Phillips talked about this in parliament yay gonna, yeah so um uh, Rowan interviewed Jess Phillips for her new ma magazine Perspective available all, all oh, uh, actually it's not available <laughs> I don't know it's it's available you look it up at the website it's, it's yeah. subscription only because uh Oh, don't ever try and sell a magazine on WH Smith's. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can, I can, I can sympathise. So, yes, you interviewed Jess, Jess Phillips. What did, can you give us an, any insight on what she said about yeah. it? So she, she is such a fantastic human being, I think. And it was just... Actually, what it was, she said it on a podcast and then it sort of cropped up like she said it in Parliament. But her point was that, that it is hard for women... This is another form of inequality and it's an important one and women find it hard to ask for their desire to be met. And I think because we're partly... And I really don't want to be down on men. I love you, men. <laughs> so, but, but there is... When we have an inbuilt culture of people-pleasing, mm. don't we? And the fact that there is a thing where women fake orgasms, I think, tells you everything you need to know about pleasing. Because why would you do that? Why would you pretend to someone else they'd given you pleasure when they haven't? Unless we're frightened. If we're thinking about their feelings not ours. Absolutely and I think as well when we talk about the orgasm gap and it's very I can absolutely understand why a man might feel upset or defensive I'd be, I just imagine how hard it would be to be a man in that position who believed that you know he'd been pleasing a partner and discovered yeah. not and it's not the it's not at all that men don't know what they're doing or they're bad at sex it's that we live in a world where women even now I think are told that they should sort of make themselves sexually available. They shouldn't pursue pleasure. They shouldn't spend time, you know, with themselves, by themselves, touching themselves and working out what feels good. That, you know, women are just, you know, told, as you say, to, that their pleasure is not a priority. And so how on earth do you go in... Because you've got... To, 
everyone is different. Every single body is different. How can you communicate what works for you and your body when you might not know that? And I think the other tricky thing is sometimes that I know, and I've interviewed women and had conversations with women who get a lot of pleasure from sex without ever having had an orgasm. And it's that very tricky thing where it's like one more thing to do. I think it comes with a lot of pressure if it's not yeah. something. And I think so too. That it would be lovely to sort of say this is really important and this pleasure should be something that everyone should partake in if they want to. But also we should celebrate all the wonderful things that come with sex that are pleasurable mm. and do feel good even yeah. if they're not that mm. ineffable climax. Yeah. It's not all about yeah. the orgasm, is it? Yeah. Mm. I, we've actually run out of time for our, uh, we just got here. I know, of our conversation. I'm going to throw it out to the floor to see if there are any, any questions from anybody. Excellent. Just wait for the mic, wait for the mic to come. Uh, yes, I, was going, uh, I wanted to know from both of you what um, the split of uh, your readership is, male-female. Huh. Well... I don't have the erotic review anymore, but it was about, I'd say that was about 60% men readers, 40% women. But having said that, we did find that most people, it was a really unusual erotic magazine because people read it as a couple. So it wasn't something that got hidden away in the house. So I, I felt like it was a, I'd like to think it was a romantic aid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's lovely. I mean, I think the readers of Insatiable are overwhelmingly women but I'm really delighted that I've heard from a few enthusiastic men including my brother-in-law who sort of picked it up not expecting to enjoy it and then really did which is like because I want it to be for everyone and I've, it's got lots of jokes in it you know whether or not you find them funny is anyone's guess but um you know that's the hope I've heard that so I live in it's Margate. very funny it's very oh, funny yeah very much um in my local bookshop the Margate bookshop um the proprietor Fran uh, just sent me a message to say a priest bought it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he should have been saying a mass. It's Sunday, but um, that's wonderful. I might be excommunicated like Madonna. <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, any other questions? Um, I'm in the process of writing an erotic novel with my girlfriend in collaboration right now, and it's our first time both of us working in that genre. And wondered if you could look back to when you first started working in publishing and writing about sex, if there's something you wish you would have known then that you would kind of impart to me. Congratulations. What a brilliant project. And, you know, it is none of my business, but I hope to goodness it's, um, I'm sure that's enhancing your relationship in all kinds of ways. But that's such a wonderful thing to do, I think. It's so hard to communicate what we want, but to put it on the page, I think that's a brilliant way. Um, I mean, I, th I, had, I had to write like no one was going to read it ever. I had to really go into my head. And it feels like kind of, you know, being on the, on the ocean floor, I suppose, and just trying to allow myself to be uninhibited. And I do, you know, personally sort of, you know, fantasise a lot and make stuff up and think of things and think of details. So I was really just doing that. And I think that that's the best thing for any writer. You know, there'll be... Editors and all kinds of people have helpful notes and ideas, but the best thing to do is to sort of to write that very, very first draft, just, you know, almost in private and in secret. And you know, you're your own best reader. You it, it's lovely. I really admire people who sort of, you know, write for others, but it's what we're talking about, you know, giving and selfishness. I think that the best writers are probably very, very selfish writers, and you've really got to write for your own gratification. Yeah. Yeah, I think it has to turn you on. And if it turns you on, then it will turn the reader on. And it definitely seems to be true that most of the best erotic fiction has some degree of taboo in it, mm. that you're making the reader, or, or with erotic cinema, the viewer, or erotic art, that you're, you feel a bit squirmy, a bit on whoever's consuming that feels, is someone watching me read mm. this? Mm. Or is that person sitting too close to in the cinema as I'm just disorientated because this... This is getting to me. It's in some way that feels a bit too personal and intimate. And if you can, if you can do that to you as you write it, then it'll probably transmit to the reader, and those books tend to do best. I mean, the story of O is obviously the most famous, but... And in the same way, I'm sure... I've you know, never written, you know, horror novel or thrillers, but I'm sure that 
if you were writing in that job, you'd really have to scare yourself yeah, and yeah. know what your fears yeah. were and make yourself uncomfortable. It's all emotions to be in touch with and sort of feelings to provoke. Yeah, and pace, actually, I think. Because I think actually, what you say about horror, but also comedy, because all these things are about pace, aren't they? You've got to set it up. You're sort of, you know, the great joke or the scary moment. And it's the same with sex. You've got to pace it so that you've teased the reader. Mm. They're kind of like, oh, I can't bear it any longer. Yes. Please make them have sex. There's <laughs> absolutely got to be a sense that you might not get what you want because yeah. it's so good when you do. I think so we were talking about this eroticism because people say pornography, I think, always gives you what you want. It's this much bang for your, for hey. your buck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but eroticism is interesting because you often, you often actually want to be frustrated. Mm, yeah. that, that to, really push towards the place and then, and then oh my God, they've, you know, I thought I was going to find fulfilment, yeah. but it's been denied me. And I, I think the people, you know, when you fall in love, being a bit denied at first mm. yeah. really builds your desire. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's a really uh, perfect ending and I want to... Um, I really want to thank you very, very much, Rowan and Daisy, for being on this panel. I also want to thank, before we applaud, um, the Bolbeck Foundry for their support of this, of this uh, Let's Talk About Sex session. Yesterday, someone said to me, I love sex, but I don't want to talk about it. And I thought, oh, gosh, it's going to be quite a hard session. But it's really great. Thank you for speaking so candidly. Thank you for being so brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.